Every decision has consequences, whether you make a right decision or whether you make a wrong decision. Some have more consequences than others. You know, I think back about when I was a kid at home and my dad was a really busy person. And so consequently, I didn't learn a lot about his early life. And I think back and wish that I had asked him more about what things were like when he was a boy. But I do have a few stories and uh, some of them <clears throat> are rather humorous, at least to me. One of them is that my dad uh, and his sister were very close together in the same age, and they lived uh, way out in the country in the cotton patch uh, of North Louisiana. And they lived on a, on a dirt road, <clears throat> which most people did, by the way, at that time. And uh, once a year, one of the big events that happened during the day was a mailman would come. And the kids were always looking for the mailman to come, and they'd run out to the mailbox before the dust settled from him coming. And once a year, uh, it was not unusual that companies would send uh, examples of their wares to try to entice people to uh, buy their stuff. And so one of the things that evidently every spring came in the mail was a sample of chocolated x lax <clears throat> And it was a chocolate bar. It was a pretty good sized chocolate bar. And you can imagine, you know where this is going, right? You can imagine, you know, these kids, two, two kids looking forward to that big chocolate bar coming. And it, uh, they knew, they learned what it was and what it would do. But the enticement of having a half of a big bar of chocolate was enough to cause them to ignore what consequences they knew were going to happen. And so whenever that chocolate to the X-Lax bar came in the mail, then they just took it out right then and they broke it in half and each one of them ate a half. And you can imagine <clears throat> what the consequences were, and their mom was perfectly fine with that because they needed a good cleaning out anyway, I guess. So, uh, <clears throat> but I just think about life is filled with decisions, and every decision that we make has consequences. And whenever we're in the process of making the decision, quite often we are really we think heavily about. What are gonna be the consequences of me making what I know is the right decision in this instance? And we see what those consequences are. And one of the reasons that that's so powerful is because the consequences of making a right decision quite often come almost immediately. And the consequences of making a wrong decision quite often don't come until way down the line somewhere. You don't know. And I see that in parenting. I see that in marriages. I see that in all, all relationships. That whenever you think, okay, I'm, and, and normally to, to make it even more complex is to do the wrong thing is almost always easier than doing the right thing. And so when you think about making those decisions, then it's really easy to make wrong decisions and selfish decisions. And even though sometimes we know what the right decision should be, then we justify making wrong decisions because it's what we want, because we don't have to pay any seemingly consequences right now. And life is filled with decisions, and some of them are rather insignificant, and some of them are frighteningly important. And unfortunately, we sometimes get those two mixed up. And the really important decisions we take lightly and the, the really insignificant ones that are not going to have eternal consequences, we really think those are really heavy and, and we spend a long time making those decisions and they're really important to us. 
And we we're talking about and began in the last lesson that I had. <clears throat> and by the way, I want to thank Jordan for a really fine lesson last week and filling in. He did a great job. Amen. The, and as I, we think about making decisions, and I entitled these couple of lessons, have to or want to. What standard do we use in making decisions? It's obvious that different people use different standards. Some people feel like that it's perfectly fine to abort a child, and other people feel like that's murder. And what people consider to be their truth is not always equal. And just because you consider that to be your truth doesn't make it right. And we make decisions about everything. And the world has a standard, and we as Christians have a standard, and they're different. The world summarizes its standard with phrases like, if it feels good, what? Do it. That's the standard. That is a standard. It's the standard by which many people are making lots of decisions right now. But we as Christians live by different standards. In fact, God has made certain decisions for us already. By saying, thou shalt and thou shalt not. But it's those matters that fall in between that give us the problems, where there is no explicit, thus saith the Lord or thou shalt, or thou shalt not. And there are only principles to guide us in making decisions. And as you've heard me say on more than one occasion, only adults can truly be guided by principles. Children have to have laws. They have to be told, you shall not, or you shall. And then their job is to look for loopholes from that point on, right? But if a person is truly, truly seeking to serve the Lord, a principle is enough. And it's going to guide us to make the right decisions in our life. We've been looking at principles which God gives us to guide our decision. And last lesson, we looked at four principles. Will it be spiritually profitable? Have we got that we can put up? <clears throat> Will it be spiritually profitable? 1 Corinthians chapter 6. Will it slow me down in the race? Does it enslave? And am I using as, it as a cover for my sin? And as I think about those principles... It strikes me that those principles basically deal with how does this decision affect me? Look at them. Look at those principles. They basically are asking questions that have to do with how does this decision, how will it affect me personally? And I have one more of those, but then I want to transition into how do my decisions affect other people around me that it's really important. So let me add one more to this before we make that transition as we think about how does this decision affect me? Not only will it benefit me, uh, is it spiritually profitable? Will it slow me down? Does it enslave? Am I using it as a cover for my sin? But then number five, will it violate the Lordship of Christ in my life? Will it violate the Lordship of Christ in my life? And I would ask you to turn to Romans chapter 14. And it's a little bit uh, fearsome for me to ask you to turn to Romans chapter 14 because once I get into Romans 14, I can't hardly get out of it, but I'm going to try to just touch across the top of it a little bit. Romans chapter 14, I want to begin reading uh, in verse 1. There's the premise in verse 1. It says, except him whose faith is weak without passing judgment on matters of disputation or matters that require reasoning for you to come to a conclusion. 
<clears throat> and that's his premise. And now he's going to illustrate how you apply that principle and what you do with that. One man's faith allows him to eat everything, but another man whose faith is weak eats only vegetables. The man who eats everything must not look down on him who does not, and the man who does not eat everything must not condemn the man who does, for God has accepted him. And who are you to judge someone else's servant? To his own master he stands or falls, and he will stand, for the Lord is able to make him stand. So we're talking about Christians judging one another on matters of opinion. And he uses, he's going to use two illustrations to show how we apply the principles that he want us, wants us to apply. The first one is food and eating something. Some people feel like it's wrong to eat this. Uh, other people feel like it's perfectly acceptable to do that. And the case in point, and, and while that may not sound like a big deal to us, in the first century church, there was a real problem with meat that had been offered to idols. And there were some Christians who could go and buy that meat out of the back door that had been aged for a day or two sitting out there being offered to an idol. And they would sell that meat out the back door and it was really the best cuts of meat and they could get them really cheap. And so they would go and buy that meat at a discount price. And there were other Christians who would say, don't you know that meat's been offered to an idol? You can't, you can't have anything to do with an idol. You can't eat that meat. It would be a sin to eat that meat. And so that was a problem during that time. And then he says, he used another illustration, one man considers one day more sacred than another, and another man considers every day alike. There are some holidays, for instance, that some people felt were wrong, other people felt was acceptable. He said, each one should be fully convinced in his own mind. So that's the first way that you apply this principle. Whatever you're going to decide about these matters, you study it with those principles that God gives you. You study it with that in mind, and then you make a decision for yourself about that. Now, it doesn't mean that everything is optional in life. There are some things God says, thou shalt or thou shalt not. But we're talking about those matters that fall into gray areas between there. He who regards one day as special does so to the Lord. He who eats meat eats to the Lord, for he gives thanks to God. He who abstains does so to the Lord, gives thanks to God. And then he says, for none of us lives to himself alone, and none of us dies to himself alone. If we live, we live to the Lord, and if we die, we die to the Lord. So whether we live or whether we die, we belong to the Lord. Now, there's a lot, a lot in this section right here, but there are two basic principles I want to draw out for this lesson. The first one is, it, I think this is one we can all agree on. Every Christian should live in submission to the Lordship of Christ, right? Uh, yesterday evening when uh, I, I baptized Anthony, one of the things that I asked him as we were there in the water about to be, he was about to be baptized, I said, do you accept Jesus Christ as the Lord of your life from this day forward? And that's a really pregnant question because it, what it means is if we agree to that, we're saying, I'm going to let him guide my life. I'm going to listen to what he has to say, and I'm going to follow him. He, he is my decision maker, and I'm going to do everything that I can to please him. And so every Christian should live in submission to the Lordship of Christ. And then the second principle is we do not all agree 100% all the time on what is the will of Christ. Is that right? You, th you think that's right? Well, whether you think it's right or not, it is right, all right? It is right. There are some times that people conscientiously disagree on certain things, but here's the principle that comes into play here. You must obey your conscience. You must obey your conscience. And if you look for instance, at verse 6, 
He who regards one day as special does so to the Lord. He who eats meat eats to the Lord. He gives thanks to God. He who abstains does so for the Lord, and he gives thanks to God. So this is a very conscientious thing. This person believes that what he's doing, whether some people are eating, some people are not eating this meat, and both of them feel like that they're, they're okay with the Lord, that their decision is okay with the Lord. And truthfully, it can be. But it might not be because of the effect that it has on your relationship to God and the effect that it has on others. And we're going to talk about that effect on others in just a minute. But the principle is you must obey your conscience. And if you'll look down here at verse 14, it says, as one who is in the Lord, Jesus, I am fully convinced that nothing, no food, is unclean in itself. But if anyone regards something as unclean, then for him it is unclean. So that says you've got to follow your conscience. And if your conscience tells you this is wrong, then don't do it. And you'll be safe in that. Now, some people's conscience will tell them it's okay to do something, and that doesn't automatically mean it's okay for them to do it because it may be in violation of some clear teaching. So in all of this, we have an obligation as Christians to make sure that we continually educate our conscience. And how do we do that? Here we are one more time. How many of you are up on your Bible reading? That's, by the way, that's fewer hands than we have had. And most of us are at home more than we have been. And so we need to catch up on our Bible reading. That's the way you educate your conscience. You learn some stuff when you read through your Bible. You learn about God and you learn about his will. And you learned about it in a number of ways, the way that he responds and reacts to certain situations. But if you violate your conscience, you sin. That's what he's teaching here in Romans 14. And so don't allow what somebody else does to embolden you to do something that you believe is wrong because it becomes a sin for you. Now, your conscience operates according to what you understand to be right and wrong. And it provides, <clears throat> this whole discussion provides <clears throat> a context for a much quoted verse, the last verse in this chapter, verse 23. It says, the man who has doubts is condemned if he eats because he's his eating is not from faith. And then the last phrase, everything that does not come from faith is sin. This whole chapter is coming down to that one line. Everything that does not come from faith is sin in your life. And so as we are contemplating making decisions in our life, and one of the principles that we apply to it and has everything to do with our relationship to God and has everything to do with our relationship to our fellow man. And as comes out clearly in Romans 14, and the principle is, will it violate the Lordship of Jesus Christ in my life? And then the next principle. Will it help other Christians? And now we're making a transition. Will it help other Christians by my example. First Corinthians chapter eight, verse nine says, be careful that the exercise of your freedom does not become a stumbling block to the weak. Sometimes, and we in America, we've really gotten enamored with our rights and our freedom. I mean, we've become obsessed with it and we're not gonna let anybody interfere with it. And they can just go jump in the lake if they don't like it. It's my business. And it's not anybody else's business. Well, that may be an attitude that many Americans and people around the world may have, but it's not an attitude that a Christian has. Because a Christian is concerned not only about how this affects my relationship to God, but it, how it affects my relationship to my brothers and sisters. Remember, others are watching you and they're taking their cue from you. And remember Romans 14, 7, none of us lives to himself alone and none of us dies to himself alone. 
So let me ask you something. Do you want your children and your grandchildren to attend church regularly? I'm just giving you one example out of thousands. Then you better do it. Do you want them to not curse and use God's name in vain? Then you better stop if you do it. Whatever you want your children to do and your grandchildren down the line to do, you better do it yourself. And whatever you don't want them to do, you better not because that business about do what I say and not what I do is the mantra of a hypocrite. Stay away from alcohol. Stay away from drugs. Stay away from foul language. If you really want to be effective in teaching your children and your grandchildren, then you live what you say and you do it consistently. Otherwise, you're gonna give them a reason to be a hypocrite also. You know, I, I, I probably shouldn't use this illustration, but my dad, came home from the war, like most people in World War II, uh, came home smoking a couple of packs of cigarettes a day. And all this time, he's telling me not to do that. Well, guess what? When I was about 17 years old, we were out hunting one day, and I had a pack of cigarettes in my pocket, and I pulled one out and lit it up. And I did it deliberately so he could see me do it. And I watched him as I did. And I saw the pain on his face. And he came over to me in a minute and he said, boy, what are you doing? And I said, what does it look like? And he couldn't say a word. And so, well, my decision and what I'm doing in my life help other Christians by my example? And will it help my family? And then the next one, will it lead others to Christ? 1 Corinthians chapter 10. If you have your Bibles, you might like to turn there. 1 Corinthians chapter 10, beginning in verse 27. If some unbeliever invites you to a meal and you want to go, eat whatever's put before you without raising questions of conscience. And we're back to this meat thing. But if anyone says to you, this has been offered in sacrifice, then do not eat it, both for the sake of the man who told you and for conscience sake. The other man's conscience, I mean, not yours. So what responsibility do you have for somebody else's conscience? You have responsibility about it. He says, for why should my freedom be judged by another's conscience? If I take part in the meal with thankfulness, why am I denounced because of something I thank God for? So whether you eat or drink or whatever you do, do it all for the glory of God. And so will it lead others for Christ? And you see that scene, two Christians are there at a meal, and one of them has a strong conscience that allows him to eat the meat, another one has a weak conscience, and he has some objections to that. And who, your choice, are you going to insist on your freedom? Are you going to forego that for the sake of your brother, the unbeliever? You have to make a decision. And you have the opportunity to impress upon your brother your concern for his welfare rather than just insisting on your rights. Show him something that he doesn't see in this world. Some sincere concern and love and submission so that he can conclude, now there's a brotherly love that I would like to experience. Have you ever seen that in your life? Have you ever been in a situation where you saw a Christian do something and you said, you know what? That's the way I want to be. I, I want to be like that. I want to make decisions like that because it's obvious that that person has something 
a deeper love than I do. Hebrews chapter 13, verse 7 says, Remember the leaders who spoke the word of God to you. Consider the outcome of their way of life and imitate their faith. Boy, as Christians, we have responsibility to people around us, don't we? And so will it lead other people to Christ? You know, if you listen to and laugh at filthy jokes, you're going to have a real hard time talking to that person that you laughed about that with. You're going to have a hard time talking to them about the Lord. I mean, you just killed yourself as far as your influence. And it can be just one time. And they remember when you were participated in that with them. And then you come and start talking to them about Jesus. What do they automatically think? And then the next one is, not only will it lead others to Christ, but what would Jesus do? And I know that we've heard that, many of us, since we were kids. 1 John 2, 6 says, Whoever claims to live in him must walk as Jesus did. And this principle will make you talk when you prefer to be silent, and it'll make you be silent when you prefer to talk sometimes. It will cause you to associate with people you might not naturally be attracted to because you want to influence them for Jesus Christ. What would Jesus do? Who did he associate with? Where did he go? Who were his friends? What did he put importance on in his life? And I realize that this is really a judgment call because a lot of people say, well, you know, I, I'm doing what I think Jesus would do and they are doing something that in fact directly contradicts what Jesus has said. And so it's not an absolute, but for, for a person who is conscientiously wanting to make decisions and please the Lord, that's a good principle to apply. It depends on how well you know Jesus, number one, and how conscientious you are about applying what you know about Jesus. And then, last of all, 1 Corinthians chapter 10, verse 31, says, So whether you eat or drink or whatever you do, do it all for the glory of God. And so ultimately, as we're making decisions in our life, one of the principles that we need to consider as Christians is, will it glorify God? And obviously, these overlap one another. Will it exalt God? Will it make God proud of you? Will it make God and Christianity attractive to others? Will it glorify God? making hard decisions, making decisions in life, making decisions Christianly. Do I have to or do I want to? It makes all the difference in the world. And you want to get to the place where this is what I want to do. And when you get to that place, then you can use these principles. And you're not trying to justify your own selfish decision, but you truly want to please God. You truly want to bring glory to God, regardless of what it costs. And there's going to be a cost for every single decision you make in life. Will it glorify God? Will it exalt Him? Christ calls us to live by a standard other than if it feels good, do it. 1 Corinthians 10, 33. Here's your principle, I think, that summarizes this lesson. Principle to guide the application of these uh, truths in our life. Even as I try to please everybody in every way. Paul's writing this. For I'm not seeking my own good, but the good of many, so that they may be saved. Can I read that one more time to you? Even as I try to please everybody in every way, I'm not seeking my own good, but the good of many, so that they may be saved. So as you make decisions in life, and we make lots of decisions, be mature enough, care enough about what the Lord wants us to do that we can be guided by principles. And we don't have to 
somebody has to say, where does it say in the Bible that I have to do this or that I can't do this? That's a, that's a child. That's a spiritual child that says that. Will it be spiritually profitable? Will it slow me down in the race? Does it enslave? Am I using it as a cover for my sin? Will it violate the Lordship of Christ in my life? Will it help other Christians by my example? Will it lead others to Christ? What would Jesus do? And will it glorify God? And so I commend this lesson to you with the hope that along with myself, and you realize that any time that I stand up here and preach a lesson to you, if I'm not gonna be hypocritical about it, then I have to apply these, these things to my life too. And I'm not standing up here and telling you that I'm perfect in it, but I'm telling you that every time I study and every time I, I come to you with a lesson like this and I'm reminded that there are some things that I need to clean up in my own life. There are some things that I need to change and get better at in my own life. And so I'm hoping as we're on this journey together that we can encourage one another because I'll say this, and I, I hope I can say this for you too, I truly want to please God. I want to make God happy. I want him to be glad to see me on judgment day. Don't you? I want to hear those words, well done, good, faithful servant. And how I make decisions in life has everything to do with whether or not I hear those words on that day. Think about it while we stand and sing.